I believe that we can heal the brokenness in the world by getting rid of managers and bosses and create leaders and coaches and mentors who look at the people in their span of care as somebody's precious child and take seriously, profoundly seriously, the impact they make on their life as they realize their organizational goals by inspiring and recognizing the goodness in the people. I am filled with hope and appreciation for people like you, Julie, who will help us spread this message in the world where we can create a sense of purpose and meaning through our professional experience and return home each night feeling valued and treat our spouses and our kids as we have been treated. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. I will live every day as if there were a microphone tucked under my tongue. It's great to get in the game, but don't get in the game until you understand the rules till you're an insider. Your life changes when you begin having a different conversation in your head. What we need to do in radically deep problems is propose radically visionary solutions. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Greetings, everyone. My name is Julie Masters and welcome to another episode of Inside Influence, in which I delve into the minds of some of the world's most fascinating influencers or experts in influence to get to the bottom of what it really takes to own your voice and then amplify it to drive an industry, a conversation, a movement or a nation. Now, here's today's question. What does truly human leadership look like? If I asked you to take out a piece of paper and write down all its component parts, where would you start? Would it be words like empathy or vulnerability, bravery or presence? Now, as a leader, if those words, those words that you wrote down became the goal, what exactly would you change? Sometimes words like these, you know, they're easy to talk about in an abstract sense, but knowing how to put them into practical action and the stakes are high and emotions are on the rise, like maybe sitting in a hotel room alone at the beginning of the GFC and watching your entire pipeline disappear. More on that story later. Well, that's, that's just a different game. Combining survival with phrases like everybody matters, as you'll hear a lot today, can seem at best counterintuitive and at worst impossible and maybe even naive. Because as leaders, that's what we're there for, right? The tough calls, the the hard choices, the conversations that no one else wants to have, difficult decisions that no one else is willing to step up for. So where does our humanity fit within that job description? Where does our humanity fit with business strategy at large? Is there a place for it? And is there a place for it that is so compelling that not only can we succeed while holding on to it, but we can succeed because we hold on to it? My guest today would answer that question. Absolutely. Today, I speak with the incredible Bob Chapman, recently named as number three CEO in the world by Inc. Magazine and top 10 social capital CEO by International Business. Bob Chapman is CEO of Barry Waymiller, a $3 billion global capital equipment business with more than 12,000 team members. Bob became the senior executive of this private company back in 1975 at the tender age of 30 after his father unexpectedly passed away. As an 80-year-old business with $20 million in revenue, outdated technology, and a very weak financial position, it wasn't long, literally a matter of days, before the banks flew in to call in their debts. Despite all those obstacles, and there have been many since, Bob applied a unique blend of strategy and culture over the next 40 years to lead Barry Waymiller through more than 100 successful acquisitions, as well as successfully navigating the GFC and more recently, COVID-19. Over the past two decades, a series of realizations led Bob away from what he describes as the traditional management practices that he learned at university to what he calls truly human leadership, a people-centric approach where his employees feel valued, cared for, and an integral part of the company's purpose. At Barry Waymiller, they have a unique measure for success, and they measure it by the way that they touch the lives of their people. The transformational impact of this approach became the inspiration behind his Wall Street Journal bestseller, Everybody Matters, The Extraordinary Power of Caring for Your People Like Family, co-authored by Raj Sisodia, founder of Conscious Capitalism. In this conversation, we go deep into why we currently have a huge crisis in leadership with disengagement in the workplace costing a whopping half a trillion dollars every year. And according to Mercer, a massive 75% of all employees saying that they would take another job if one came along due to not feeling valued or recognized. We talk about the fundamental difference between management and leadership and Bob's own personal journey from a me-centric approach that he had been taught at university to a we-centric approach that became the key to their success. 
What happens if you dare to treat every life you encounter and employ as you would your own precious child? Because, you know, let's be honest, they are somebody's precious child with parents that want the exact same for them as you would want for your own children. We go into the most underutilized tool in leadership that I know, the bravery to actually listen to how people feel, including two of the most powerful questions a leader can ask. How does that affect your life? And what did that feel like? We talk about how and why he went on to develop the GPO, the Guiding Principles of Leadership by Barry Way Miller, and how it went on to have more impact than he ever could have imagined. And finally, the moment Bob realized that one of the biggest indicators of the success of his organization and the nation wasn't its financial position, but the marriage survival rates of its people. At the heart of today's interview is a CEO and the team behind him who have created a workplace that not only consistently outperforms the marketplace, having survived some of the hardest economic downturns of our time, but has done all of that, not despite their commitment to behaving like a family, but because of that commitment. And then, then there's also the man, a father and a grandfather who on that journey has become absolutely convinced that truly human leadership is the only way we are going to create a world that we would want for our children and our grandchildren. From the places they work, where they spend the majority of their lives, the schools they attend to the leaders of the nation that they call home. As for me, I have spent an entire career asking people to show up and use their voice. And that's what I want for my children and everybody else's child a world where they can actually be heard. And that was my main realization in this conversation, that Bob's mission to create cultures of true listening and genuine care, that lives at the very core of making that happen. If you are looking to take your journey in influence to the next level right now, don't forget to hop onto my website or the show notes and download the brand new version of my ebook, The Influencer Code. It covers the seven areas and the seven core questions that after 20 years of building teams of influencers, I have found to be hands down the most useful when it comes to rapidly increasing your own level of influence. Just pop in your email and it will be in your inbox in the time it takes to pour a cup of tea. My newsletter, Influence Insider, also gives one bite-sized tool, strategy, or mindset shift per week, all on the topic of building a more influential life. I work very hard to make sure that they are short, sharp, and immediately actionable. So again, hop onto my website, juliemasters.com, and become an insider. For now, sit back, ride on, stride out, and soak up a masterclass like no other with the CEO at the front line of the next frontier of leadership, the incredible Bob Chapman. Welcome to the podcast, Bob Chapman. It's a pleasure to be here, Julie. Thank you for the invitation. You are very welcome. You're very welcome. I want to kick off our conversation today with a question that I usually ask at the beginning of each podcast, and that is what one idea is having the most impact or influence on your thinking at the moment? And I know you bridge many ideas with with the work that you do in the world. I've given a lot of thought to that question, and I would say to your listeners, the major challenge we face as a society is the poverty of dignity, expressed beautifully by Thomas Friedman in the New York Times when thinking about all the issues we are seeing through the media we face in the world about the civil unrest, pandemic, kind of a dysfunctional uh, political environment. And he said, we don't have a poverty of money, we have a poverty of dignity. And I believe that we have been given the vaccine that could address this poverty of dignity in the world to learning to care for the people we have the privilege of leading. That is the overwhelming thought I have right now that's driving my behavior and my thinking. I'm, we are going to go so deep into, into that way of thinking. But I, I wanted to just rewind a second to give people some context as to how your journey led you to where you are right now. And I know that you ended up taking over the reins of Barry Waymiller unexpectedly in 1975 after your father passed away. And at the time, the company, and this is, I believe in your words, the company was a 90-year-old business. Um, It had outdated technology, a weak financial position. And I read this beautiful story about the day the bankers flew in. Can you tell me what happened on that day? Well, tiny bit of context. I had left Price Waterhouse to join this family business, never having thought about doing that. But my dad invited me in, and his invitation was, I need somebody I could trust. That was my title, somebody you could trust. So 
So I worked with him six years in this business that had been struggling for the entire 20 years my dad had been running the company. <clears throat> but but the beauty was I, with that title, I did everything in the company. So suddenly in 1975 in October, my dad was leaving for Australia the next morning with my mother. We had dinner together, wonderful dinner the next morning. He left this earth uh, for a heart attack. And so I stepped into a company unexpectedly to run it, even though he had said at dinner the night before, I'm going to name you executive vice president because you're really running the business. So he emotionally said that the night before he passed away the next day. So I would say to you, when you kind of are thrust into a situation of leadership, you rise to the occasion. Again, I'd love your listeners to know from my worst challenges came my greatest growth. So I would say to you in hindsight, thank goodness the banks pulled on us because I grabbed a hold of that business with both hands and I turned it around in nine months. It had the most profitable year in nine months, but I did it with traditional business leadership practice. It was not a cultural transformation. It was a financial transformation. So that's how my journey began. I began by taking over the struggling company at age 30 with no real guidance, no real mentor. And, uh, you know, I did it out of response to losing my dad and trying to keep this company alive that uh, I had been a part of for six years. So that's how the journey began. And that must have been, I mean, I can't actually imagine you've, you've lost your father and, and then the bankers fly in and say, right, all, all debts are due now. We don't know you very well. Um, we knew your father. You're, you need to pay up. And you had said, you know, about that time that you've just resumed, assumed responsibility for this entire company. You've assumed responsibility for all of these lives. And you had studied management. You had a degree in management, but that didn't really prepare you well for what was coming next. Why was that? I realized as I reflected back on my education, it was always about me and my success and success as we defined it, was money, power, and position. And it really didn't matter how you get it as long as it was legal because we celebrate those as attributes of success. It, so I was never taught to care for the people I'd have the privilege of leading. I was never told that the way I would lead this company would affect people's health and the way they go home and treat their spouses and treat their children and behave in our communities. I always thought business was business Personal life is personal life. Never, I was never told that, never learned that. I only learned that later as we transformed from management to leadership. And people told us the profound difference it made in their personal life when they, when they were treated with respect and dignity at work. So I began, again, the first half of my career was what I had learned at, in, in undergraduate school in accounting, graduate and MBA, and at Pricewaterhouse. So I was applying the tools I'd been used, which were about profit organic growth. That was how we measured success. I was never taught to care for the people I would have the privilege of leading in my journey. And you have said, I mean, that was a, you went on an incredible journey from there. And you've said before that during that journey, you had a series of realizations that led you away from the traditional me-centric version of management that you were just talking about there into a we-centric version of leadership to truly human leadership. I want to talk about some of those realizations. One of the ones that I've heard was you becoming a parent fundamentally changed the way that you approach leadership. And I can very much relate to that in my own life. And I think a lot of leaders in this world can talk to me about what that, what that shifted for you. Well, you have to kind of put together a couple of pieces. This happened when I was in my thirties and early forties and Cynthia and I were raising six kids and I wanting to be a good steward of those six precious children that came into our life. I went to programs about parenting and raising kids. I'm gonna, by the time we're done with this podcast, you'll never use the word management again <laughs> because you can't manage anybody. So, so I'm experiencing over here the qualities of, of parenting that allow children to become who they're intended to be. And over here, I'm practicing uh, business and management, trying to take what I did in education. And over the, uh, I'll call it the 80s and the 90s, as I was bringing these six kids and my stewardship with Cynthia to, to be who they're intended to be, what I was realizing is management and leadership is identical. I'm sorry, management and parenting is identical. Leadership and parenting is identical. That, that basically, uh, 
what is parenting? You know now, very, it is the stewardship of these precious lives that we are privileged to have through birth, adoption, or second marriage that we all take very seriously. That is parenting. What is leadership? The stewardship of these precious lives of people who walk in our building every day and simply want to know they matter. And so I realized a lot of the things I learned about parenting is identical. It's identical. Caring for the people, whether it is your child or my child, everybody is somebody's precious child. And when you look at the people you have the privilege of working with as somebody's precious child that's been placed in your care, it profoundly changes your sense of responsibility for that life. Instead of about you being there so I am successful, our organization is successful, is that I look at you and say, how can I allow you through our organizational goals to be who you're intended to be and go home each night feeling a sense of purpose and fulfillment so that you can be a better mother, a better, uh, a better spouse, a better citizen of this world. So it was very clear to me that parenting and leadership is identical. It is the stewardship of the lives that we have the privilege of having in our span of care. You know, I felt like, I felt like applauding when I, when I read that for the first time. No, I did because in this podcast and this podcast has been going for three years now. And I have, I've had a number of different parenting experts on this podcast and I've been challenged a few times by people to say, well, this is, you know, you shouldn't really have parenting experts on your podcast. This is a leadership podcast. This is a podcast about influence. And I, and I've always come back to the place of, I believe that if you are trying to influence people with the best of intent, the best of intent for their future, the rules of parenting are far better guidance to your journey than most of the rules of management or leadership as we've been discussing them. Like if you can understand parenting at its, at its highest place, then you are going to be a better leader for everybody who's around you. And so to hear you say that was just one of those moments where I was like, yeah, I literally felt like applauding in that moment. General Flynn, who wrote this forward to Simon Sinek's book, Leaders Eat Last, he came into our operations in Akron, Ohio with Simon, spent the day talking to our people uh, about our culture and his views. So here's somebody from the Pentagon involved in, in marine leadership development coming in and talking to our people in our plant for a day. He sat down and he said to me, very much in alignment with what you just said, he said, in talking to your people, the thing that stands out to me from my experience in leadership is that they described it as a family. He said, they did not describe it like a family. They described it as a family. And I said, General Flynn, isn't that interesting? None of those people are related to each other, okay? They don't live in the same household. They don't have the same parents, same kids. Why would they use the word family? And we came to the realization they use the word family without even thinking about it because the word family in most societies means the place of ultimate care, right? Ultimate care and safety. So they, our team members described it to General Flynn as a family, which means I feel cared for and valued like you would like every family to be, okay? Because, again, when you look at people as somebody's precious child, knowing that the way you lead them will affect their health and their family life, why wouldn't you view them in the same way you want to view your kids? I mean, I, somebody will say to me, Julie, what do you do about the people that don't get it? And I say, just treat them like you'd like your son or daughter treated if they didn't get it. They'd say, Oh, that's different. And I said, what's different? There's somebody's son or daughter you're treating that way. So when you look at people through the lens as somebody's precious child, it for me, it changed everything the way I felt. Okay. No longer were, was, were they here for me to be successful. I wanted them to be. I wanted them to have lives of me and purpose. And there's also a flip side to that coin as a CEO, as a parent, which is if you're going to treat everybody as if they were your child because they are somebody's child then you need to be willing to make the tough calls sometimes. You need to be willing to hold the the values that you have created for that family as fiercely as, as a parent would. Well, again, Julia, nobody said parenting is easy, right? I don't know if your journey, <laughs> right? You know, somebody said to me one time, boy, this truly human leadership seems like it would really be hard. I said, you're right. Name anything in life that's meaningful that's easy. Is it easy to be married and, and fulfill each other's dreams about that, that partnership to create through marriage? No, it is not easy. Is it easy to raise kids? No, it is not easy, but it is what life is about, about future generations that carry forth our values and our principles through the, way, the lives they live. 
You have said before that you believe we have a crisis of leadership at the moment. Can you walk me through what do you mean by that? When I began this journey and I started being asked outside to talk about our journey, I started hearing statistics that I've been quoting now for years that nobody debates. And the most and these are pretty much global statistics. 88% of all people feel they work for an organization that does not care about them. Okay. Three out of four people are disengaged in what they're doing. They're doing exactly what they need to do to keep their job and not announce more because they feel disengaged. When I talk to CEOs in the world and I say, you're all worried about the cost of health care. You are the problem. 74% of all illnesses are chronic. The biggest cause of chronic illness is stress and the biggest cause of stress is work. Okay. We are creating the healthcare crisis because we don't know how to care for people. We use people for our organizational goals and we don't treat them with respect and dignity as individuals. So we are creating the healthcare crisis because stress is the single biggest cause of illness, okay? Jeffrey Pfeiffer of Stanford wrote a book, Dying for a Paycheck. And he doesn't mean anxious to get it. He estimates that we're, in America, we're killing 120,000 people of work-related stress every year, much less all the other people who are sick but don't pass away. The other one, uh, Rashi Zodio told me, who wrote the book Conscious Capitalism, he said that there's a 20% increase in heart attacks on Monday mornings when people have to go back to work. Okay, Gallup recently came out with a statistic, which is shocking, 65% of all people would give up a salary increase if they could fire their boss, okay? 58% of all people would trust a stranger before they trust their boss, okay? The statistics are overwhelming that people are frustrated and, and don't feel valued. And we know for a fact that they go home and treat their family less than they would if they felt valued. So. We're, when we wonder about what's wrong with kids today, what's wrong with kids today? Is it the social media or is it the family unit where they're raised? OK, are they experiencing love and care in a way that validates their worth and allows them to go out in the world enriched by the love that they experience and witness between their parents? They witness in the community because right now, you know, remember before the pandemic, Julie, in America, we had the lowest unemployment in 50 years. We had, we were at peace in the world. We weren't sending young men and women off to war. And we had a strong economy. Yet we had the highest level of anxiety and depression we've ever had with peace and prosperity. Why? Because people don't feel valued. They feel used. They don't know how to articulate it. But again, the anxiety and depression is at a crisis level in the world because we have never learned to care. We've, we've been taught to to use people for our organizational goals and to discard them when we don't need them anymore as a thing rather than somebody's precious child. Talk to me about the guiding principles of leadership that you developed. As I said, you, you took on this company, you, you took, on, took on a massive journey there, and it took you to a place of, of, of writing these guiding principles of leadership. Yes, it was. Um, let me compare the guiding principles of leadership to the constitution of your country. In other words, there's got to be some foundation to govern our, our countries, right? So in our case, it's our constitution, which our, our judges try to uphold in our country. And what happened was when we began these transformational experiences where I said, why can't business be fun? Why do we call it work? Uh, and, and we began doing some things that aligned fun with value creation. We saw not only a dramatic change in performance, which I didn't expect. I just wanted people to have fun. But what we saw was a dramatic change in joy when people started having fun. And so we tried it in our customer service area, which had dramatic impact, which we had no idea it would have. I just wanted people to have fun. Then we tried it in engineering and a few other areas. And eventually I said to our chief people officer, Ron Spencer, there's something going on here bigger than we understand. We need to get a group of thoughtful people together, stand back and say, what is going on? We try these eclectic ideas and we see dramatic changes in joy, performance, uh, every attribute you'd like to see. So we gathered a group of about 20 people together about 15 years ago. We sat and we talked about what we were experiencing. 
and we started writing it on a board. We had, again, we were just trying to understand what was happening. And the more we wrote down, I stood back at one moment in this two day meeting. I said, oh my God, those are guiding principles of leadership. So we, the unintended outcome was the creation of a document that I am amazed at that is now the foundation that guides us. I cannot imagine going on a cultural journey without a similar doc document. How could our, how can America uh, fulfill its, uh, the intention of the founding fathers without a framework to guide us? What were some of those principles? What were some of the principles in the, in the GPO that, that led to these forms of conversations? Well, uh, one, one of the ones that sticks out to me is uh, clearly that we're going to pay people fairly and treat them superbly. Okay. That was one. So it's not about, a lot of people think it's about compensation and benefits. We got to be competitive. What we found is profoundly, we focus more on the way we treat people than, than focusing on surveys of compensation and benchmarking. Because everybody thinks it's a matter of money, and, and again, if there's if, if all cultures are bad, then it does come down to money. But what we what we focused on was making sure that we were good stewards of those people, and and trust is the foundation. So we based our, this model on trust that we basically trust in the goodness of people, and that we wanted everybody to realize their potential. So you know we were very focused on personal growth of everybody, not just the senior team members, et cetera. So it gave us a framework for recognizing and celebrating the goodness in people. But again, it, uh, that document's available online. I feel to the, you know, 15 years later, I wouldn't change a word, which astounds me. It was an unintended consequence of under, trying to understand what was happening when we mixed fun recognition into our leadership model, as opposed to management, uh, stretching people, you know, all the typical things we do to try and challenge our organization to higher financial performance, because this was all about being better stewards of the lives entrusted to us. And, and again, we aligned, we, it was an eclectic group of people who I thought had a good heart and a good mind. And we came together and created a document to this day that guides us when we have to make decisions, uh, around that golden rule, we measure success by the way we touch the lives of people, not just our team members, but our suppliers, our communities, our bankers, et cetera. We touch a lot of people's lives and we need to think about the ramification of what we do on the people whose lives that we touch. Can you just give me, a, you know, one or two practical examples there of the way that you took that, the fun and recognition and how it played out in some of the initiatives that you put together. This is my first revelation that captures that. And I, I can only explain this in hindsight. I was, what I'm gonna to say to you, I was not experienced at the time, but I put, I've gone retroactively and understood how I came to this. So I acquired a company in South Carolina, about a $55 million company. And I was flying down there the first day I owned it. I paid about $24 million for it. It was a major transaction for me. I was highly motivated to make sure it was a good acquisition. So I flew down there to be there the day they opened under our ownership and I was in the in the cafeteria having a cup of coffee and I, I was nobody knew me I didn't know them so I wasn't introducing myself I was just standing there and and it was during in America what we call March Madness where everybody bets on basketball okay it's called March Madness and they're having fun they were talking about which team won which you know how much they won fifty dollars ten dollars and they're having fun and the closer they got to eight o'clock you could just see the fun go out of their body now, I didn't know it at the time. This is in looking back on it. But my first meeting was with our customer service team, which sells spare parts to the machines we built. About eight people. So I walked down the hallway. It's about a $21 million product line out of the 55. It's very significant. So I walked down the hall to sit down with this group of eight people I'd never met before. And my wife hates it when I say this, but the only word I can express was what popped out of me was to this group of people I'd never met before. I had no agenda. I just said, we're gonna play a game. I said, what? I said, yep, we're gonna play a game. Whoever sells the most parts each week wins $100. And if the team makes a team goal, the team gets $100. And I said, they had 21 reasons why that would not work. Or I handle this account, I do this. I, I said, and I had 21 reasons why it would work. 
and I was absolutely confident and I'd never done of it, never thought of it, never read about it, never tried it. It was totally just spontaneous. Well, guess what happened? Revenue jumped by 20%, but joy jumped by a thousand percent. And I went back and said, I just wanted you to have fun. What happened? And this one lady named Vicki said, Mr. Chapman, I always thought I was nice to the customers. Now I'm really nice to the customers because I want to I want to win. Another gentleman said to me, Mr. Chapman, you know, when the phone rings, if you're working on a project for a customer, you kind of keep your head down, hoping somebody else picks up the phone because they're either complaining about something, they had to do something. So there's no reward in picking up the phone. So now, because of this game, we're actually calling the switchboard operator and saying, how do you decide who gets what calls? Okay. And I said, oh, I, I, I was just, my mind was exploding with, oh my God, I never would have thought of this. And then, and, and then, you know, one gentleman said, Mr. Chapman, when we get a request from a customer that we can't solve, we need engineering input, we write a requisition and we send it to engineering. And when it comes back, we call the customer. Now we walk it over to the engineering department to get an answer so we can call the customer that quickly and win. And I thought, oh my God, what have we discovered here? I mean, again, they handled the customer better. They responded quicker. They were having fun. And, they, and on Friday nights, if they were close to the goal, they were texting each other. Okay, we're only 10,000. Does anybody want to come in on Saturday? See if you can't get a few orders. And the joy, the camaraderie and joy was unbelievable because they, it's like, we put a scoreboard up and they everybody knew the score and all of a sudden they were having fun. Can you imagine playing a sport without a scoreboard? Okay. No, you got to know the score, right? Most people in our company have no idea what the score is and they play the game and we expect them to be motivated and inspired, but they have no idea what the score is. This, when we brought this score to everybody in the customer service, it was profound. So I would say to you, and, and, and again, we tried this in a variety of other areas in our company over time, and that led us to this discussion about the guidance solutions. I was astounded, but it was clearly stimulated by watching people have fun betting on March Martin madness. There's, there's so many pieces to that. I want to just, I want to talk to the, that's the recognition part. So it started with fun. It moved into recognition. Talk to me about the trust piece, because some of the most powerful stories I heard was how you completely changed the way that you trusted the people under your care. It's my nature. I'm an extremely optimistic person, which I think is a characteristic you need in leadership. Okay. I never, never have I in my journey tried to get people to trust me. I tried to be, to give them the view that I trusted them. Okay. I never, and probably the greatest uh, example of that is in America, we have unions and they kind of against management to protect management, usually adversarial relationships. Well, when 08, 09, economic downturn happened and we froze our retirement contribution in the crisis because that way we could not let people go and, and we could get through this. The union in our big union we have in Green Bay, Wisconsin, volunteered to join us in that outside of their contract because they said, we trust you. Okay. I was profoundly touched that I didn't ask them if they trusted me. I behaved in a way I thought they could trust me, okay? My goal was never to get people to trust me. My goal was to get people to know that I cared about them, okay? And trust is an outcome. It's not a, a goal. It's an outcome. But it's also leadership, right, where you start, you model the behavior. So my goal is not to get you to trust me. My goal is for you to know that I trust you. So you start with the behavior that you're looking for others to, to grab hold of and run with. Yeah. Trust is not a goal. It's an outcome. Okay. I want to go back to something you said before, which was the 21 reasons. You said there was, there was 21 reasons why people were telling you that wasn't going to work. And when I was reading about the guiding principles of leadership and your journey and applying them, it occurred to me that that wouldn't have been as easy as it sounds. You know, there would have been a lot of pushback when you first started putting that out there. How did you deal with those 21 reasons? The response from people around you when you're trying to Get these guiding principles into place. Well, I would say to you, you have to understand the guiding principles of leadership came out of a time when we had one of the biggest scandals in American business history, which was Enron, the energy company that collapsed. And so we had just created these guiding principles of leadership. 
And I was incredibly, I mean, I had it framed like the Constitution because, and had everybody sign it because I thought it was transformative. So I, so Rhonda, my chief people officer, looked at me and she said, Bob, Enron had beautiful statements on the walls. They just didn't live them. And she kind of put that to me as a professional challenge. And I looked at Rhonda in response and said, Rhonda, I'm not going to put them on the wall. I'm going to put them in people's heads and hearts. And I decided to start traveling around the world, meeting with groups of people and saying, we have created these guiding principles of leadership. We believe these are aspirational goals in terms of, of impacting your life. How are we living these values? And the very first meeting in South Carolina was amazing. Amazing. So I'm sitting with a group of people from the plant and the office, you know, probably about 12, 13 people. I articulated our guiding principle leadership. And one gentleman said, Mr. Chapman, I've got a question. I said, go ahead. I said, Mr. Chapman, I work in the assembly area. And recently I was given the privilege of tra- f- flying to Puerto Rico to install a machine. I flew, you know, got an airplane ticket. I flew down there. I worked with the customer, very successful installation. As I came back to the plant after two weeks in Puerto Rico, as I was walking in the plant with Mary, who works in the accounting department, we got to a certain point where she turned and went into the office and I went into the plant. She went and sat down at her desk and got herself organized for the day. I went and punched a card to validate I came, okay? She wanted to call home to see how her daughter was feeling. So she just picked up the phone on her desk. I had to wait for a break and have change to put in a pay phone to call my child and see how they were doing. When she wants a cup of coffee, she simply walks over to the coffee machine. I have to wait for a coffee break. He said, Mr. Chapman, why do you trust me when I'm in Puerto Rico and you don't trust me when I'm in this plant? And I said, oh, my God, you just nailed me. I had never seen the way we treat you compared to Marion Accounting. The way that was beautiful. I said, you no longer have to punch a card. Okay. When you want a cup of coffee, you're welcome to get it. We're going to put phones in the plant so you can call home. Because I had no idea that historic practices had led to this difference in the way we treat people with respect and trust. Again, and, and, I, and furthermore, as I was walking up to the storeroom that day with the president of the company, which had a you know, cage around this big storeroom and shipping department, I said to the president, why do, why do we have all these people in, inside that cage? He said, they're not inside the cage, Bob. That's inventory, and we have to secure the inventory. That's just normal practice. I said, so you're telling me that if we didn't have a cage, people would walk off with shafts and motors and gears and sprockets. He said, well, no, Bob, you've got to secure the inventory. I said, Dan, take down the cage. Let's tell people we trust you, okay? And so we took down the cage, which was profound. All of a sudden, these people weren't locked up in a cage all day with inventory. So that, that experience, that experience to that plant in South Carolina was profound to me. I had no idea that we, by our behavior, that we sent a message that we didn't trust you. Okay. But it was clear. There's something in that moment of listening and the bravery of listening. You know, you could have gone one of two ways then you could have defended the current practices, even if it was part of the conversation, you know, here's why we do this. Tell me more, but you went a completely different way. You went to a place of literally celebrating that moment. You know, that was beautiful. I invited you into this conversation and you showed up. That was beautiful. Give me more. You know, there's something in that moment that enables this to take flight. Yeah. I, you know, the McKinsey people who read my book, everybody matters, this lady named Elaine Rogers is brilliant. She said, you know, when I read your book, Bob, what I realized is that one of the things you did in your journey is the questions you asked. Okay, not what you told people, but the questions you asked. So people shared with you things they never would have shared with you. And in this case, one of the questions I asked is, are we living these values that we've now articulated? And how can we move towards these and you know, I had no idea what people told me. And then the other thing that I said to people is, how did it make you feel? It is astounding when you ask people, how did it make you feel? Not was the outcome, but how did it make you feel? 
And nobody ever asked that question in business, right? A number of people told me that was their moment. When Bob asked somebody, how did it make you feel? You heard things you could never imagine, Julie, because people feel able to share their soul, okay, when you ask them how did it make them feel. Not what was the outcome and what, you know, what did you achieve? Uh, so changing the language through the questions we asked, people told us things that exploded our heart and mind with, I had no idea we were doing this to people, okay? I had no idea. Did you ever feel any form of trepidation? I'm just trying to imagine, you know, you're going into these conversations, you're deliberately taking the genie, letting the genie out of the bottle here and going, you know, here I am, I'm completely open. I've set a bar of the way that I want us to be. Come tell me how we do this. Come tell me your current experience. Did you ever feel nervous that people were going to start asking for things that were, you know, that couldn't be done, that weren't viable? I can just, I'm just feeling into how a lot of leaders might feel in that moment, which is, you know, if we, if we open this up, we might end up in a place where we can't meet whatever's coming back at us. After that conversation with that gentleman who talked about traveling and installing the machine, and we said we're going to take down the cages, we're going to put phones in, we're going to eliminate time cards. We had a very traditional, very nice gentleman, but very traditional VP of manufacturing. And I went to him and I said, okay, we're going to do these things now. He said, oh, my God, it's going to be chaos around this. I mean, his reaction was exactly what you said. I didn't, I, I don't know why... Julie, but my heart has been open to the human aspect of our business. And so I never had an ounce of reservation. I mean, I, if you said, did I ever have trepidations? Never. I'd love you to share. There's a story that you tell about a 7 a.m. management meeting with somebody under your employee called Steve. Would you share, would you share that story for us? Because I think that this shows the Potential implications of everything that you're talking about now. Yes, that is a, it was a powerful experience for me uh, and one I talk about a lot. So we had just bought this $200 million company in Green Bay. Uh, I f we brought all of our leadership team around the world in there. And the VP of operations said to me the night before the meeting started, Bob, you might want to walk out in the plant tomorrow because we have some team members that have embraced the ideas of lean manufacturing of Toyota production system, continuous improvement. You ought to acknowledge the good work they've done because they've done some really good things. So I said, well, why don't you just invite them in to, and, and let them share their story with all of our senior leaders from around the world? So next morning at 7 a.m., they walk in, these three very fine assembly team, none of whom I had ever met, didn't know them. And their, their leader said, you guys want to go over and present to the global leadership team what you guys have achieved in the plant. So kind of unprepared, they walked over and got in front of our 40 or 50 people from around the world and started sharing what they had done come together to challenge, to improve the way we did something. In this case, built a machine. And it was all about numbers. We came together with a goal of re improving quality, reducing costs, shortening lead time, and we shared ideas. And we achieved this goal. We reduced costs by this. It was all about numbers, which is the language of business. Now, I'm an accountant. And I sat there, not even paying attention to the numbers. I was watching these three gentlemen who had no idea that they were going to stand before our global leadership team and share their journey. And it, it, as they came to end at like 15 minutes, I looked at them, to this one gentleman, Steve, who, again, I never met before. And I said, Steve, how did, did it affect your life? Okay, and I remember I said to you some of these questions that had come to me, that was a spot. I had no idea I was going to ask that question. I don't know why I asked that question. But I learned more asking that question than anything I can imagine. So I said, Steve, how did it affect your life? Well, here's a guy that had no idea he was going to talk to the global ship team, just got done talking about numbers. And the CEO of the company said, how did it affect your life? So what I heard was the truth. He said, Mr. Chapman, I've worked for over 20 years in this company. Again, before we bought it. And I now realize that every day I came into work, I punched a card to validate I got there. I went to my workstation. I was told what to do. Nobody ever asked me what I thought. I got 10 things right, and nobody said a word. I got one thing wrong, and I got my ass chewed out. They complained about my pay and my benefits, but they didn't give me the things I needed to do to my job. I now realize in that 20 years that when I went home at night, I didn't feel very good about myself. 
And when I got to my house, I'd open the screen door and throw my hat in. And if my hat came flying back, I knew my wife was in a bad mood. And so I'd go to the, the tavern and have a beer. Since you brought the guiding principle of the leadership into this organization, where people actually ask me what I think, and working with my team members, I can make things better. And I get appreciated for what I do through your recognition programs. When I go home at night, I feel better about myself. And when I get home at night and I feel better about myself, I'm nicer to my wife. And you know what? When I'm nicer, she talks to me and said, Steve, we're going to have a new metric in continuous improvement, the reduction in the divorce rate in America. Because if we send 88% of all people home feeling like Steve did and they treat their spouse because the way they've been treated less than in a loving, caring way, and our children experience that relationship with the parents. No wonder we have the anxiety and depression and family issues we have in this world because we are sending people home damaged, not feeling valued, and they behave and treat others as they have been treated. And I've got 100 stories like that. So Steve that day helped me see that the way we treat people at work profoundly affects the way people go home and treat their spouse, their children, and behave in our community which is contributing to the poverty of dignity. And so you actually started measuring that. You started measuring the divorce rate. <laughs> I said we should measure the divorce, the reduction <laughs> in the divorce rate in America. I have not developed a survey company yet. That could, but all I know, again, when we teach people the principles of leadership, not management, 95% of the feedback is how it affects their marriage and their relationship with their kids. I don't need it. I mean, if I tried to measure love between you and your husband and your kids, how would I do that? How would I really measure it? How do you measure respect, dignity, and trust? You can do all kinds of surveys, but when I, the way I measure it, I go out and listen to people share with me the stories I hear from people around the world about how it feels to be valued would make you sob for a week of, and give you hope that we have been given the secret to the world the way it was intended to be, where we cared for people, not things. One of the core, one of the core things that I think makes your story so incredible isn't the fact that you, you know, you came up with these guiding principles of leadership, as you said, you know, Enron had guiding principles of leadership. It was what you did to enable it to become lived in every single human being within your organization for anybody out there who's sitting there going, well, we have these, you know, we have these principles. Why are they not getting lived out there in our organization when we leave the building? What have you, what have you learned about that transition from, from these are the way that we want to be to people grabbing those and running with them and reinventing their entire culture? So I think I can answer this question to your audience this way. About 15 years ago, uh, we went out to California to meet an author who wrote a book about leadership. And we took a brand new team member named Brian Wellinghoff with us on the visit to meet this author. And we were sitting at dinner the night before the meeting, and Brian, not knowing me, asked me a question somebody that knows me would not ask me. He said, what's your greatest fear, Bob? Well, I don't, I don't even know what the word fear means. I'm an eternal optimist. And so I, I paused a second and I thought, and I said, you know, Brian, my greatest fear is that we will have been given a leadership vision that could heal the world and it would die with me. So we got up the next morning and I said, okay, Brian, you've identified a fear I didn't even know I had. Now, what are we going to do about it? I said, how do religions survive over centuries? They articulate their beliefs, the guiding principle of leadership, and then they tell stories that validate their uh, belief through disciples, Okay. So I said, we need to create disciples who believe what I believe. So it's not Bob's theory. It's we believe this is the way we're called. Not Bob believes we're because Bob will leave this earth. And these principles are too profound to ever leave this earth we've been blessed with. So we said, how are we going to create disciples? We can't send them back to graduate business school to learn to be leaders because we teach management, not leadership. So we said, we're going to have to create a university to create disciples who believe what we believe and live these principles. So the beauty is we had a clean slate and a fresh group of people. So we created leadership content to transform managers into leaders, which was profound, okay? With the goal of creating disciples 
and converting managers into leaders, okay? Manipulators into stewards. And and the beauty is that because it was a clean sheet of paper, we had no preconceived expertise. So the first thing which astounds me that the team came up that we need to teach to convert managers into leaders is empathetic listening. And when they said that to me, I said, what? We need to teach adults to listen? They said, oh, yeah. And I said, no, no, come on. That, that doesn't make any sense. I said, Bob, we have to. So they overrode me. We also taught, which is, came from my parenting, recognition and celebration. There are skills. You can't just ask people to be care, to care for others, because they say, sure, I, I'll do the best I can. What you have to do is teach them how to care, okay? You cannot ask people to care as leaders. You have to teach them how to care. And so we taught recognition and celebration. We actually have classes where we taught people the specific skills to let people know they matter in timely, thoughtful, appropriate ways, okay? So we studied how to do that. We taught that. And then we have culture of service. Seizing the opportunity to serve others is a class. So those are the three foundational classes. And it was amazing. We would see, I would go to graduation for these classes and we had grown men and women crying because why would they cry after these classes? Because I never cried in any of my co collegiate classes because they realized that they had hurt the very people they loved the most because they hadn't, these practices are so human, so family oriented, you know, so caring that, uh, that they, they cried. Okay. And so I would say to you, that is how we, the guiding principle leadership came to life. We, we wanted not to put them on the wall. We wanted to put them in people's hearts. But we, again, when the CEO roundtable came out and said, we need to start caring more for our people, not just our shareholders, that was a genuine statement from fine gentlemen. The problem is they have no idea how to do that. To do what you did and take the commit the map to paper, you know, to put your principles to paper. So we are driving this bus and this is the map we are using. It's committed to paper. I don't. I don't know how you do it without guiding principles because other, you're just situational. You make all your decisions. Ways. But let me give you an example in terms of the value of that constitution or cultural constitution. Oh eight oh nine hits. The economy starts collapsing. Every organization starts laying off people. I go to a board meeting like three months into uh, the crisis. I walk in the, the the boardroom and my board members say, "Bob, don't you have to lay off people?" I said, why do you ask that? I said, well, everybody's laying off people. I mean, everybody's laying off people. General Electric, Bank of America, everybody. I said, well, you know, I think we got a pretty good backlog. I think we're going to be okay. We got good financial security. So they said, well, aren't you, you sure you're not being optimistic, Bob? And I said, no, I don't think so. So probably six weeks, eight weeks later, I'm in Italy visiting our Italian operations. And I get an email from our U.S. operations that our largest customer placed a multi, you know, $20 million, largest order in our backlog, they placed it on hold. It's one thing not to get new orders, but to actually take the orders we had and see those dissipate. And so I sat in my hotel room in Italy. I said, oh my God, it's hit us. Okay. And without the guiding principle of leadership, I would have done what I'd done for 20 years before that. When you don't have the work, you let people go. It's just what we're doing. It's not personal, Julie. It's not that we dislike you. It's just that we have to be good stewards of this business. And if we don't have work for you, you know, you're just going to have to leave the company. So I sat there in this room and here's where the guiding principle leadership. So I had done that a million times, you know, whatever number of times in my first 20 years. And I sat there in 2008 and actually this was probably in March of 2009. And I said, well, wait a second. If we measure success by the way we touch the lives of people, and we let people go in this environment, we're going to hurt people. And so my mind then went, well, what would a caring family do if a family had a crisis? They'd all pitch in and take a little pain. So nobody had to take a lot of pain. So all of a sudden, an idea surfaces all within minutes in this hotel room in Italy. I said, well, wait a second. What if we asked everybody to take a month off without pay? and we wouldn't have to let anybody go. So I immediately emailed back to the States to our chief people officer and I said, how would we do this? If we asked everybody to take a month off without pay, how would we do this? 
I'm flying home tomorrow, gets ideas. I plan, they come up with a plan to implement this. And we announced to the company that everybody's going to be able to take a month off of that pay when they want to take it, not when we tell them they can. So, and the reaction was unbelievably positive because even though they're going to give up one twelfth of their earnings, which is hard for anybody, they felt a sense of compassion and charity to the other fellow team members. Now the person to their left and the right in the office was not going to lose their job. Okay. They weren't going to lose their job. So it was active, a charity, a compassion for others. And people felt such a sense of relief that we were going to get through this and everybody would take a little pain. So nobody had a lot of pain. We went right through that. People, elder, elderly people volunteered to take younger people's time who couldn't afford it. Uh, some people went and worked for their church. Some people took vacations. They never want to, but the reaction was unbelievable. It did more to validate our culture, but it was driven by that guiding principle. If we measure success by the way we touch the lives of people and we let them go, we're going to hurt people and we can't do that. So honestly, people felt a sense of sacrifice for the good of others. There was also that trust piece, right? As I, I remember reading about this and, you know, there were certain people who were saying, well, I can't afford, I can't afford to take my week, you know, it's coming up. I can't afford to take it. And somebody else to their left or their right saying, you know what, you can't, but I can, I'll take it for you. And so you opening up the boundaries there. Of- and you know, what? and the person that did that, do you know how good they felt taking somebody else's week? I mean, you couldn't pay for the gratitude they felt and a... I mean, the, the people love to tell the story. I did this for my fellow team member, okay? It was it was beautiful. It was humanity at its best because they weren't, it wasn't that they were losing a month's pay. It was that they were helping their fellow team members keep their jobs because it was an act, it was, it was a chat, an act of caring for the people that you work with. And we got through it and we came out of that like this. I was astounded because it was stimulated by, by that constitution of, of leadership which said, if we measure success by the way we touch the lives of people, we can't let people go without hurting them. Never occurred to me when I'd done layoffs before the collateral damage. Because if you let John go and he sits next to Mary, Mary may have kept her job, but she says, you know, I may be next. Okay, if he'll, he'll do it to John, he'll do it to me. So how could you have trust? How do you raise a family if you can't count on your job? Okay, how do you decide to buy a house to provide shelter and, and a future for your kids? If you tomorrow morning, you could be laid off for you know economic reason. But we so dehumanize that. Okay, it's just, it's not personal, Julie. It's just we don't have the work. Sorry. Uh, I'll stand here while you clean out your desk and I'll walk you to the door. Okay. So it is, as leaders, our responsibility is to care and give them a grounded sense of hope for the future and to do everything we can do to make sure we have a business model that will give them a future so they can raise a family, exist in society, and not have this cloud over their head. You know, I could get laid off because if you ever interview people that get laid off, it's one of the most miserable days of their life. They got to walk into their household and said. I don't know what our future looks like because I just got laid off. They may have given me a month. They may have given me two months, but I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. None of the people that do that layoff have ever been laid off. They're the managers, bosses, and supervisors. Okay. So it is a dehumanizing experience to be told we don't, we can't afford you anymore. And so again, a guiding principle of leadership, that foundation, that constitution, that gave me the fortitude to think differently. Okay. There's a, a beautiful line which runs through, I've heard you say it, it runs through everything that we've talked about today, and that is to lead the way you are called to lead. Do you feel, after everything you've seen, and I think I know what your answer is going to be, but do you feel like we are innately called to lead this way? Or are we innately called to lead the other way and we have to change our innate behavior? I do not believe we are innately called to lead this way, Okay. But I do believe we innately have the capacity to care because when when Georgetown University and Washington University did a survey of our, in other words, we say that 88% of all people feel they work for a company and care about them. These two universities who are studying us said, we need academic validation that, that your leadership principles are working. So they did a survey with their own standards 
of, of, of our two largest operations, one in Akron, one in Green Bay. And it came back that 79% of our people feel that they work for a company that cares for them instead of 88 the opposite way. But what they added to that, which was amazing to the professors, was they found a high degree of altruism in the company, which they had never seen before, which means the willingness to do something for somebody else without expecting anything in return. What kind of society would you like to be a part of, Julie? And what, you, what part of society would you like to see your kids part of? Where people do things for others out of love and care rather than duty, okay? So I believe that we are we in and all of us is the capacity for unbelievable compassion and caring that gets tampered down for as we move from caring for others to care for ourselves, to protect ourselves. Okay, I, I don't want to share things at work because they might lay me off because somebody else is going to do it. So my only protection is I'm the only one who knows how to do it. So we have this culture when we began laying off people, mass layoffs and layoffs. Why would you trust a company that one day walks in and says, you know, Julie, sorry, but uh, three months and you're gone. Okay, we'll give you three months to come see. So what do we do to earn people's trust? We don't do anything to earn trust. We do it to show that we care. And, and when, when you sh- what we found, Julie, is caring is contagious. When you feel cared for, you naturally care for others, which is the way our society should be. So if we send people home feeling cared for, they're going to care for their family. They're going to care for their community. But right now we send 88% of people home not feeling cared for. And we're seeing the behavior manifested in this poverty of dignity. What's your biggest fear right now? I know you, you answered the question a, a while ago when you were asked and it was, a, it was a defining moment for you. What is it at the moment? That I would not do justice to this calling that I've been blessed with. And I'd leave this earth before it became a movement that would sustain itself. That's my biggest fear. Well, on that note, if I were to give you the stage and a microphone and five minutes and put in front of you every single person you would want to influence, which I'm fairly sure is every single human being on the planet, what's the, what's the one thing that you would want them to know? The way I would say this to your audience is from my exposure to our global society, I feel we're experiencing leadership malpractice, okay? creating this poverty of dignity in the world that has become very evident to me in every part of our society, not just business, the military, government, nonprofits, education. And prior to this global pandemic, which has caught us all off dramatically, we had relative peace and prosperity, but we had the highest level of anxiety and depression ever. So if our goal of our governments around the world is to create peace and prosperity for their citizens, Why do we have this anxiety and depression prevalent throughout our country, which is affecting young kids and adults alike? Why? Because the statistics I told you, if 88% of all people go home at night feeling they work for coming and care about them and behave, you know, and therefore treat their spouse, their children behave in our community as we're seeing today, no wonder we have this poverty of dignity. So my view is that the statistics are overwhelming, which I shared with you that people don't trust their boss, they don't trust their company. How can we have a civilized society where people care for each other when we don't care for the very people that we have the privilege of caring for every day? So again, Simon Sinek would say, in the military, we honor those who give themselves in service of others. And in business, we give bonuses to people who sacrifice others in service of themselves. So Simon would say, if we can teach in the military that officers eat last, which means a profound sense of responsibility to the men and women we care. Why can't we teach business leaders the same thing, that their primary responsibility is the men and women in their care, okay? Primary responsibility. And the answer is we can, we are, through Barry Women University, we're teaching that. So what we've realized, though, and when we're out in, in society now, sharing this blessing we have through our Chapman & Co. Leadership Institute, through my book, through the TED Talk, through all the mediums that I shared with you that are available on YouTube, what we realize is we're treating cancer, but we're not curing cancer, okay? The cure for this cancer of self-interest, lack of caring, is our education system. Because our education system was originally designed to have informed citizens in our various countries, but then the Industrial Revolution came along and we needed skills. We needed engineers, accountants, uh, scientists, lawyers, marketing specialists. So our universities became 
uh, education factories, okay? We got good raw material, the smartest kids we could. We processed them through a system, and then we sold them to the market. And if we got a good price for them, we must be doing things well. We didn't create, though, the skills. So we gave Henry Ford and other industrials what they wanted, which was skills, but we didn't give them what they needed, which was leadership skills. So what we are suffering from is decades of manipulation rather than stewardship, where the organizational goals were profit, profit growth, organizational growth, share value growth, not human dignity and, and, and self-realization of your purpose in life. I believe that we can heal the brokenness in the world by getting rid of managers and bosses and create leaders and coaches and mentors who look at the people in their span of care as somebody's precious child and take seriously, profoundly seriously, the impact they make on their life as they realize their organizational goals by inspiring and recognizing the goodness in the people. I am filled with hope and appreciation for people like you, Julie, who will help us spread this message in the world where we can create a sense of purpose and meaning through our professional experience and return home each night feeling valued and treat our spouses and our kids as we have been treated. Thank you so much for your time. And, you know, on a personal note, we, we talked very briefly at the beginning of this conversation about the fact that when I started out in leadership, I was in my early 20s, had no idea what I was doing. And I wish wholeheartedly that I had access to some of the things that you are teaching and the principles that you have developed. And I'm so grateful that they're out there for the next person who's embarking on this road so they don't have to fall down as many times as I fell down. <laughs> <laughs> well, Julie, that's what led us to do this. The number of people, when we started teaching this to a, the grown adults, we would measure the success of our classes by man tears, okay? If people weren't grown to tears, we knew we had not touched them. Now, we had no idea we were going to do that because what people realize when we teach them what caring leadership looks like, they realize the very people they had hurt that they did not intend to hurt. And, and again, so I would say to you that we know, we know without a fact that we've been blessed with a vision of the way we are called to treat others, that we have the privilege of leading our life so that they can go home each night and be good stewards of lives in their care. So the ripple effect of this is dramatic, you know. So, again, the opportunity to share this with somebody as thoughtful as you, a relatively new mother, a successful business person, to realize that business could be the most powerful force of good in the world if we simply taught our leaders how to care for the people they had the privilege of leading. And care, like parenting, does not be nice. It means being good stewards of these lives so they can realize their life potential and go home each night knowing that who they are and what they do matters. And we can begin healing the brokenness we're feeling in the world that would, would cause. Again, when my granddaughter graduated from Aspen High School four years ago, at this graduation ceremony where everybody's cheering as each child walk up and got their diploma, I had tears in my eyes knowing the world we were sending these kids into. There was a good chance they'd get hit and hurt. I believe we can change that. I know we can change that. We are changing that. And I cannot tell you how much I appreciate this exchange with you. Thank you so much for your time, Bob. It's my joy. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and have seized hold of at least one tool, idea, or mindset that will help you start raising your own level of influence. Now, for those of you who want to take the next step in your journey or would just love a roadmap to becoming the most influential voice, idea, or brand in your space, then I have good news. You can now download the latest updated version of my ebook, The Influencer Code, from my website, juliemasters.com. Also, there's a link in the show notes. Just pop in your email address, and I promise I will not spam you, but it is jam-packed full of ideas, tools, and case studies that I have come across in my now 20-plus years of doing this work, not to mention the seven areas and seven core questions that I have found to be hands down the most valuable when it comes to immediately lifting your ability to make an impact. Download it, keep it, share it, juice it for all it is worth. I hope it makes a massive difference in both your career and your business. Thank you always to my co-founder and the main brain behind this podcast, Lauren Kelly. You kick my butt in all the right ways. Thank you for making it happen. 
And if you did enjoy the show, then we would love you to share this podcast and leave us a review on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, whatever your platform of choice happens to be. And don't forget to subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode.